right, so we're here to listen to Roger Pulvers, um, and I think he's known to many of you, which is just as well, because he's quite difficult to explain in, in, a short, uh, in, a, in a short period of time. Um, but he's published over 50 books in Japanese and English, and also um, plays and film scripts, and has worked quite extensively in um, film and television, including as assistant to the director on the film Merry Christmas, Mr. Lawrence. And he's won a number of prizes, and indeed uh, last year was awarded the Order of the Rising Sun, uh, i.e. a Japanese honour. Um, and effectively, this is your memoir. But uh, you lived for many years in Japan and just moved to the UK a year or so ago. And it's the second time you've spoken here. So. Thank you very much. Thank you. Could just could you read the book? Just That's book. Yeah. <laughs> this is the book, and uh, it's called The Unmaking of an American. I used to be an American at one time, until 1976, when I became an Australian, just about the same time that Rupert Murdoch changed from being an Australian to an American. So I'd like to think I improved the karma of the world just a little bit at that time. And this covers by my youngest daughter, Lucy. I have the privilege of having almost all of my books have covers and illustrations by my three daughters who are artists. And hopefully well, there will be question uh, Q&A after I finish speaking, and then hopefully we'll be able to uh, it's upstairs, isn't it? Go upstairs. Downstairs. Down. That's right. This is upstairs. And have some wine. Uh, speaking of wine, I, I read recently in a magazine that alcohol was very bad for the health. And I decided at that very moment I was going to give up reading magazines. <laughs> so, uh, uh, so hopefully we'll have a, a little drink afterwards and, and a chat. Um, I arrived in Japan from Los Angeles where I grew up on September 14, 1967. I had studied at UCLA and Harvard Graduate School, but I had studied Slavic languages and Soviet politics, Russian history, so I knew nothing about Japan. Somebody said I should go to Osaka, and I'd never heard of Osaka. I didn't know where it was. I didn't even know it was a city. So I was very fortunate that I didn't have any teachers to pass on their prejudices and predilections and likings and dislikes about Japanese culture. I, I found my own prejudices and dislikes and likes. Uh, so and having taught Japanese for many years, I put a burden, I think, on many of my students. Um, what was Japan like in 1967? I went to Kyoto and it, I taught Russian and Polish at Kyoto Sangyo Daigaku, which was a new university then. And uh, Japan was rather unsophisticated when it came to foreigners. There were almost no foreigners who spoke Japanese. Of course, in the beginning, I didn't, but I learned it rather quickly. <coughs> there were a couple on television. Some of you will remember E.H. Eddick and Rui James, but neither of whom was a real gaijin. They both spoke Japanese from childhood. But because they had white faces, they passed as Henna Gaijin was called a strange, weird Japanese, Japanese weird foreigner, as that means. Uh, and Gaijin, the word Gaijin at the time, foreigner, applied only to Europeans. A lot of people now don't know that. Gai, there's Gaijin and Gaikokujin. Gaikokujin is a more formal word for a foreigner, and Gaijin is, in fact, Gaijin now is considered a word of prejudice and can't be used uh, uh, in lots of books, serious books. Uh, people get offended. I don't know why. It doesn't, doesn't offend me, and I think it's wrong, but nonetheless, at the time, a gaijin was a Westerner, and Chinese people, or Filipinos, those, they were called gaikokujin at the time. I learned Japanese very quickly, but one, as many of you know, who speak Japanese, that learning Japanese or any foreign language is not about, only about vocabulary. It's about the manner, mannerisms and the ways of breathing and talking. I learned very quickly that in Japanese, it's very different from the languages that I knew. And I, the, the, the lesson came when people asked me where I went to university. And I said, Habado, Harvard. And they went, <laughs> <laughs> making these sort of sub guttural, sublingual uh, sounds that I didn't understand. And I was wondering what the reaction was. I'm sure many of you know that Japan has what's called a brando shiko, a, 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 a sort of brand consciousness. They like brands. 
I think this basically came from the tea ceremony in Kyoto a long time ago, hundreds of years ago, when the tea ceremony masters preferred little cakes. We saw Matsukaze or little cakes from a particular shop and so on. They became very, very um, conscious of brands. And Habado, like Oxfordo and Cambridge, became very important kinds of brands. And they still are, even when these places have had ups and downs in the home country, they've maintained a high reputation uh, uh, in Japan. So I realized when people asked me the university I went to, I would have to say it in a different way. So people asked me, well, where did you go to university? And I said, yeah, I know. So this Yeah, <laughs> so you say in about 15 seconds, or it takes, should take about half a second to say. Then in 1972, when I went to Australia to teach at the ANU, the Australian National University, first night at a party, a lady came up to me and said, Where did you go to uni? I said, I'm sorry, could you say that more slowly? Could you please say that more slowly? Uni, mate, uni! I'm sorry, I'm really, there's a thing called the dialect barrier. I mean, it's much worse than the language barrier. Anybody can overcome the language barrier. So when I finally figured out what she said, I said, well, um, no, wait, that's not really, I mean, she said, are you all right? <laughs> so I realized that one nation's naturalism is another nation's surrealism. Uh, but um, back to 1967, I fell in love with Japan on my first taxi ride from Haneda International Airport to the city. It was my first, um, there was no Narita, obviously, in 1967. I looked through the window, like looking through a magic lantern, and I thought, I said to myself, obviously in English, because I didn't speak Japanese, this is my country, I'm going to stay here for the rest of my life. It was a little bit like Lafcadio Hearn when, in April 1890, he set foot on the quay at Yokohama, and that he absorbed all of Japan through his leg at that time. All the rest was just knowledge that he needed to fill in. And I felt that way, and that has never changed my passion for Japan, my love of Japan, my commitment to the company has never wavered despite governments that are the rival for in their uh, idiocy, those of uh, some other countries, like one which is very close to here, which we won't talk about, or actually which I will talk about in a minute. But um, that's never wavered. What I liked about Japan was, especially coming from the United States, the absence of rhetoric. I grew up in the greatest country in the history of the world. And if you think that's Great Britain, I'm sorry, you have another thing coming. Uh, and there's only one country, one, the, old, the country that has the only true democracy, working democracy is what I was taught at school. And when somebody said, what about Great Britain? I said, no, they don't have, their constitution isn't written down, so they can't be a democracy. Which is proving out to be true, actually. Uh, and Sweden had socialism, so it couldn't be a democracy. So any other country you would bring up was, was ruled out uh, from the United States. And when Americans say that um, America is a great country, they mean something very different from Australians who say Australia is a great country. Because Australians mean it's a country with a great lifestyle, nice people, a good place to live. But when Americans say America is a great country, they mean a powerful country, a country that is meant to lead. And I think that's a problem. And if I have time, I'll go into that But uh, as well. Um, I learned Japanese very quickly. And I learned that the Japanese were not used to foreigners who knew too much about Japan, in inverted commas, the so-called Hennagaijin. I had an experience with a French sociologist friend of mine who didn't speak English very well, and my French is non-existent, so we spoke Japanese, and his Japanese was excellent. We met at a restaurant in Nogizaka, and it was full of Japanese people, and they're all talking. I'm talking 45 years ago, when foreigners didn't really speak Japanese very well. And uh, he walked in, I said, Ah, you look great. And, 
He said, yeah, I don't know. Well, so, okay, this guy, how's your wife? All of a sudden, the entire restaurant <laughs> fell, fell silent. Nobody was saying a word, and for the entire meal, we were overheard every single word. <laughs> I never think, you know, couldn't say a thing in private. They listened to this. And then when it came to paying the bill, we both went up to the, the till, what's called the Beji Inn. And uh, I said, yeah, you know, I'll pay, don't worry. Yeah, yeah, you know, you paid recently. And was, My God, they're acting like Japanese. And what I realized is that, they, that those Japanese people were not aware that we do this too. The Japanese had a problem understanding what was their own national characteristic and what was universal. Why don't we try to pay for our friends when we go to the till? They didn't understand. They thought that was Japanese. It was still that sort of time in Japan. But I was attracted to something that has not changed in Japan. That's the civility, the decorum, the, uh, <coughs> that people act properly and that, uh, toward each other in general. It's not politeness, it's formality. I was attracted to that, having come from an American Jewish background, which is the antithesis of that, actually, where people always stand about that close to each other with their fingers in the lapels, <laughs> speaking at the same time. That's, the, that's what, what I, the culture I grew up in. It was quite nice to step aside from somebody and to actually listen to what they were saying. You know, the old Jewish joke of the man was asked, you know, why he got married. He said, I got sick and tired of ending my own sentences. So, I mean, <laughs> that, that sort of thing, that joke, if, I haven't told that joke in Japan, but if I did, people would say, what do you mean? And I'm thinking, you know, we don't do that, you know. We don't even talk to each other, let alone in each other's sense. So what's the, what's the problem? But I was attracted to, when, when I g do give talks about Japan, either in Japan or outside, and people ask me, you know, if you could say in one word what characterizes the Japanese uh, culture or social, the nature of social intercourse, I always use the very long word non-confrontationalism. Japan is a society which is, tries to be as non-confrontational as possible, avoiding arguments, avoid the, that's why students don't ask questions. They, it becomes a challenge if they ask a question to a teacher. That's why a lot of uh, foreigners think that Japanese are a doer, are so, too earnest, never speak their mind. Maybe they don't have their own opinion because they don't realize that in the context of the of the dei, the encounter, it's 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 not a virtue to say your opinion because you may actually it may grate with the opinion of somebody else. You'd rather avoid it. Again, the antithesis of the culture that I grew up in, but I was very much attracted to that. Before I went to Japan, my first trip outside of the United States was in 1964, when I was 20. I was born in 1944. And uh, I went to the Soviet Union, and I spent a month in the Soviet Union. And I spoke Russian, and I really felt very a, a real bond with the Russian people, even though this was, the Soviet Union was a very different place from Los Angeles, as you can imagine. And the, the leader of the Soviet Union, was Nikita Sergeyevich Khrushchev. He was first secretary of the party. And he was deposed in October of 64, but in the summer he was still there. But hearing jokes about uh, him and about Soviet power told me a lot about the Soviet Union. Because coming from a culture where, as you already heard one joke, uh, I mean, where we tell jokes all the time, self-deprecating jokes, all different kinds of jokes, this came basically to the Jewish tradition from Eastern Europe, basically, through the Polish Jews, the Russian Jews, the, the Jews who lived in what's, what's called the Pale of Settlement, which went all the way down Odessa, below Moscow, St. Petersburg, taking in Poland, Galicia, Moldova, Ukraine, and so on, and Belarus. So that's where they got that sense of humor. So Khrushchev went to a kolkhoz, which is a um, collective farm, and one of the reasons why he was deposed because of his, the failure of Soviet agriculture. And he went up to the head of the kolkhoz and he says, comrade, so how's the, uh, the harvest of this year? 
and the head of the cop was, oh, God, potatoes everywhere, mountains of potatoes, to the very knees of God, to Samik no Boga. And uh, Khrushchev said, but comrade, there is no God. And he said, there are no potatoes either. <laughs> <laughs> the other story which told a lot about the stagnation that was going to really set in when Brezhnev took power was that during Lenin's time, a train had stopped because it was overloaded. So Lenin got out and said, comrades, all out, everybody, now push. Everybody pushed the train, they jumped on and it went. Some years later, when Stalin was on a train, the same thing happened, it stopped. So Stalin said, okay, everybody out. He shot half the people, and they got on, and it was later. And the train went on ahead. When Khrushchev was in power, he was on the train, and it stopped, and he said, okay, everybody do this. <laughs> so, the illusion of, of progress was much more important than, than any sort of forward motion. So I thought, this is a very, very strange uh, country, very different from the one I had grown up in. But I felt a great deal of camaraderie with the Russian people. I think Russians and Americans have a lot in common, particularly now with, with the presidents of both countries working on the same side. I think uh, there's a lot of, uh, lot of camaraderie going on, on behind the scenes. Uh, but I wanted to have another view of communism and of the Slavic peoples. So in the spring of 1966, I applied for a scholarship to study in Poland. And I, re I applied for two scholarships, and I got both of them. One was a Fulbright, who, as you remember, named after the senior senator from Arkansas, uh, who gave scholarships to Americans for, to study overseas and for foreign students to come to the United States. And the other was a, an exchange of one student only that had been going for some years between the National Student Association called the NSA, not the NSA now, but the National Student Association, which was a broad Washington-based association of American universities and colleges, liberal arts colleges, and ZSP, Zeszenie Studentów Polskich, the Polish Association of Students. Well, they sent one student a year, and we sent, the Americans sent one. I was chosen for that first. Then a couple of weeks later, I got a Fulbright, but I had already committed to that, so I took the NSA scholarship. I went to Washington, D.C., and met the people who were my age, students, but maybe a little bit, a couple of years older, who were running the NSA, which was thought of as a liberal organization against the war in Vietnam, you know, representing American students, without knowing that the NSA was funded by the CIA. So I went off to Poland. Uh, and it was in Poland. I went to study under an economist named Oskar Lange, who was a very famous economist who had studied at, uh, who had taught at Chicago University. He died. So I ended up uh, going to the seminar of a man named Adam Schaff, who was actually on the Politburo at one time, but was considered a liberal communist, later on defected to Austria. Uh, but I went to the theater, the movies, every night. And that was when I was there. I, in my mind, I started thinking, I don't want to study political science and economics. I want literature, I want theater, I want film. But I was still only, what, 23 at the time. And in January of that year, I got a telephone call from the head of the NSA. He said, come to London. Uh, I want to speak about a meeting we're going to have coming up in Ulaanbaatar. There's an international meeting and use my credit card number. And I thought that was strange because I, not only did I not have a credit card in 1967, my parents didn't have a credit card in 1967. Generally, rich people did. Anyway, I got a ticket. I flew to London with a little suitcase, leaving all my stuff in my flat. And I was taken by taxi to Grosvenor Square, which, strangely enough, about 10 days ago, I walked by again for the second time and I thought, oh, this is where I was in 1967. It was a Sunday morning, and there was this guy who looked like something out of spooks or, or traitors, if you've seen the latest one. It was in 1960. And he said, I think you better not go to Poland. Ramparts Magazine is going to, which was a liberal magazine in the United States, a radical magazine, is going to publish in next week an article saying that the National Student Association is funded by the CIA. 
And I said, well, that's ridiculous. Of course it's not problematic. He said, of course it's ridiculous. Yeah, sure. And uh, uh, he said, you better not go back to Poland. I said, no, I'll go back because then they'll know I'm not a spy. He said, no, don't go back. You're not going back. Why don't you go to France and live with your girlfriend? I said, how do you know about that? <laughs> so I went to Paris, it broke, and all of the heat from the scandal, which went right up to the President of the United States, Lyndon Baines Johnson, was in all of the major newspapers and magazines. My photograph was on the front page of the Los Angeles Times. My parents were interviewed by Walter Cronkite. Yeah. I don't know if you know who he is. Uh, that said, my son does not work for the CIA. <laughs> but if he did, I'd be proud of him. It's not a dirty word with me. <laughs> that was from New York, as you can tell. My mother said, Roger is not a spy. He likes sports and girls. <laughs> so next time you have a, a friend who's applying for a job at MI5 or MI6, make sure to quote that. To them. <laughs> See what they say. Be interesting. I was sitting in a cafe in Paris. I got, learned a bit of French by then, and I was reading Le Monde, and there was an article about me that said that I was a suspected CIA spy, which I guess was true, because Drew Pearson, I don't know if you, any of you know the name, that's the muckraking uh, right-wing uh, journalist of the, uh, in the United States at the time, something like Hannity or Limbaugh it would be now. Uh, had thrown, heard from the CIA all about me and thrown all of the spotlight onto me so that it wouldn't be on these other uh, people who were actually, all of the people in the NSA who were my friends were working for the CIA. I didn't know it. In fact, when I was in Washington at one point, we were at a restaurant, a Chinese restaurant, and one of them said, gee, Roger, you know so much about communism. If you had to argue that communism is a superior system to capitalism, how could you do that? And I said, sure, but why would I want to do that? I don't believe that. He said, no, no, just for argument's sake. Sure, so for 15 minutes, he was taping me, saying that we will bury you and everything. So they had something on me which could have put me in jail in either place. So I've written about this in this book, by the way. And uh, so I read in Le Monde that I was now in Washington, D.C. being debriefed. And I looked around, and I thought, this doesn't look like Washington, D.C. <laughs> and for a split second, as if you have had, some of you have had truly disorienting kinds of experiences, I thought, well, maybe I am in Washington, D.C. <laughs> or maybe I'm not Roger Bowles, or maybe I am a spy, and I didn't know. I mean, these things. And I credit my becoming a playwright to that, that one or two seconds when I realized that it, it, who you are depends on what people say, say about you. So I've always said to actors in a play, uh, I said, make sure you read everything that everybody else in the play says about you to see what they think of you. And that, will, that will help you create your character. So I went back to the United States in May 1967, totally disoriented. My French girlfriend broke up with me. We were engaged. She got engaged to a brilliant philosophy student. I've hated philosophy ever since. And uh, I um, couldn't go back to France, and I couldn't go back. To, I was afraid if I went back to Poland, I'd be arrested. I did go back in 1970 at the invitation of Andrzej Wajda, the, the um, film director. So, but I didn't want to go back right away. So I went to Japan. So that's how I got to Japan. And then I stayed for five years, and I fell in love with Japan while teaching Russian and Polish. And in 1971, an offer came from the Australian National University to um, teach Japanese. So I went to Australia without knowing, knowing even less about Australia than I did about Japan. And in 1976, I gave up my American citizenship. In fact, on July 6th, 1976, 200 years and two days after the signing of the Declaration of Independence, and I became an Australian. I gave up my American citizenship and became an Aussie. So 
all of that is described in some detail here, but this, is, this book covers much more uh, uh, encounters with people like Andrzej Wajda, the film director, if you interested him, or Japanese authors, uh, because an autobiography is really not about oneself. It's about other people, particular people you encounter in your life. That's a, a very Buddhist notion. The Japanese would know that the, the proverb, so the suryamu tasho no en, when you even just brush brush sleeves with people, you're, you were destined in the former life to be with each other. So wherever we meet, it is, it had, there's some reason. It's been, right, without putting too much of a karmic spin on it, I really feel this way. There's a reason why people meet. Uh, another uh, experience I write about in the book is that of being assistant to Oshima Nagisa on Saint John Merry Christmas, Merry Christmas, Mr. Lawrence, which is wonderful. Working with Tom Conti and David Bowie every day. Um, if you remember the scene about of the, in the sand pit where Bowie is up to here, well, I spent 45 minutes in the sand pit in the middle of the night in Rarotonga, a tropical island in the Cook Islands, with moths that were as we used to say in America, yay big, uh, flying all around. And when the lights were set, I had to get out and he went in for a minute or two. That was his work for the day. <laughs> uh, lots of experiences working with him and with Tom Conti and Sakamoto Ryuichi, who became a very close friend of mine and who did the music for my film, Star Sand. Uh, one of the greatest experiences of my life was we had finished a shoot fairly early one day, and David and I went down to the bar, which was right on the sea in this tropical island. The Cook Islands are located below Hawaii, so it's three and a half hours east of Auckland, New Zealand. It's really in a beautiful spot, it's a beautiful island. And we were drinking G&Ts, and the sun was setting. A very pretty young woman in her late 20s walked by, and she stopped, and she said, oh my god, I don't believe it. Oh, what? oh my god. David started saying, she said, Roger Pulvers. <laughs> <laughs> so that's the greatest experience of my life. There's, no, there's nothing, nothing that will ever be better than that. And David was half up there. Oh, he said, that's wonderful. That's wonderful. <laughs> said, and his real name was David Jones, as many of you know. And he was a very nice guy. He was very unpretentious, very sweet. He, was, he loved the Cook Islands because it was the only place he had been in the last 15, previous 15 years where he didn't need a bodyguard, wasn't recognized. And when we got to Auckland, then he had bodyguards around him and all the time. So he was very happy there to have that anonymity. And... Uh, he didn't read music, but he used to sing all the time. We were in a Chinese, there's a Chinese restaurant everywhere in the world. There was one on Rarotonga, the Jade Garden, of course. And uh, halfway through the meal, he just started singing, I like Chinese. <laughs> and all of, the, uh, all of the other patrons in there was looking around, what is this guy singing? Why doesn't he shut up? <laughs> I didn't know it was, it was him. Now, um, I have so much to talk about uh, of things that I bring up in the book, but one of the things that I wanted to mention is the word in Japanese. Setsua. Ooh, wow. Rosalind, the microphone is over. Thank you very much. Sorry, I won't use it again. That means narrative, and it's an interesting word in Japanese. It's how how you explain in words what how you feel about yourself. And I feel in the world today, in my life of seeing being in these countries and learning the languages, we're having a real problem with national narratives. There's certainly one in this country right now. Uh, who owns the narrative? Who has the right to speak for the country? I think that's what's going on in this country, quite apart from all of the party politics and everything else, which is the nitty gritty. Who owns the narrative? 
there's a Russian proverb that goes, uh, it's not the future that is unpredictable, it's the past that is unpredictable. And that's very true. It's who, can, who makes the stories about the country. Is this country, well, we, were to, we are told that um, it's the fifth strongest economy in the world, it has so much going for it, it's a major, a great country, but if it breaks up, it won't be the fifth. Who has the right to continue on, and in what way are they going to continue on with this country? Is it the ERG? Is it Jeremy Corbyn? I'm leaving Britain this year, after a year, later on this year. I'll tell you, the words I will never forget from my stay, the four words in this country are, Order! Order! Jeremy Corbyn! <laughs> Great, that just is going to keep going on in my, <laughs> reverberating in my mind over and over again. The same thing is happening in Russia. In Russia, Putin called the, the collapse of the Soviet Union the greatest geopolitical catastrophe of the 20th century. To him, it is. What is the narrative of the United States? Who has the right to speak for the United States? This is going on now. And the same thing is going on in Japan. As far as Japan is concerned, Prime Minister Abe has taken up a narrative which came basically from the model of the Meiji period to make Japan great again, to make the military a positive force in the self-assertion and in the, in, the, in the creation of an identity for Japan, particularly in Asia, but in the, the whole world as well. And unfortunately, uh, this is not possible because the countries that are surrounding Japan, well, to the west of Japan, are much stronger than they were when Japan began that, that narrative. But that was the narrative. I won't write it on the board again, but many of you know the phrase, wakon yosai, Japanese, spirit and Western technology or Western science. And that the, was the narrative of the Meiji period, that we will modernize, but we will keep our identity as Japanese. And that they have successfully done. And that is quite a feat. That is an amazing thing to do that the Chinese are trying to do now, although they're using Chinese technology now. And I, I think for sure within the next 10 years, the, the hacking is going to go the other <coughs> way. China is going to be hacked for the, the secrets that they have rather than the other way around and will be stealing technological s secrets from, from China. Be that as it may, that was the Japanese achievement, Wakong Yosai. And it perplexed Western visitors for 150 years. What is the light motif of Western travelogues and even a lot of scholarly work about Japan for 150 years after Japan opened up to the outside world. It's Japan is a land of contradictions. It's modern and yet it's traditional. How can they do this? Side by side, everybody takes a picture of the, the Western mannequin in a Japanese kimono and the tea ceremony with a robot to, uh, serving the tea and so on. And they think this is somehow contradictory, whereas to the Japanese it's not contradictory at all. Japanese culture is an agglutinative culture. Just add things on, they tack them on, and that becomes the new definition, definition of Japanese culture. They generally don't discard things as we do. We are sort of serial monogamists. We, we change in the West, we take up an ideology and we, we use it to the hilt, then we get rid of it. And, we go on to something else, capitalism or communism or whatever. But the Japanese always tack on little things and are never hung up on the total, the total definition. What is it? Does it all, how does it all make sense? How can you explain yourselves to us? They can't, because it's just all there. It's just all there at the same time. Uh, this is an amazing quality that the Japanese have, that this is something that the British people, well, most of you are British, I assume, could learn from. You don't need to get rid of things. You, but on the other hand, if you define yourself by the nostalgia of your icons, and only that, then you are destined not to modernize. You have to just keep tacking on, adding on everything, and mixing it all together. I think this is the great genius of the Japanese. As for me, like in Poland, when I, met, when I made that change 
from uh, politics and economics to theater and film and literature. I realized, and perhaps this is one of the two or three main themes of this book, that all of the encounters that we have in our lives are, that are important to us and important in to, to, that tell us who we are to ourselves come not only from people, but from plays we see, poems we read, a piece of music we might hear, and it could happen, as Pushkin says, in a miraculous moment. It can be a minute or, or half a minute, and you, it can, you can realize that this has become a part of your own personal narrative. I had three unbelievable teachers of Russian, professors of Russian at Harvard. I talk about them here. The most famous one is Roman Jakobson, who is a, who's called the father of, of modern linguistics, of modern phonology. He taught a course in Russian, in Russian poetics, which just remains with me to this day. The other two were just as important, and I talk about them in the book. Uh, Jakobson was a very close friend, probably the closest friend to Mayakovsky, uh, Pasternak. My, both Pasternak and Mayakovsky said, after hearing Jakobson talk about their poetry, finally I'm understood. He was an amazing man. He spoke Russian in 15 different languages, uh, is what we used to say about him. But I encountered a lot of poetry. Of them. Not this particular one that I'm going to say to you was not from uh, Professor Jakobson. I found it myself in reading the poetry of Anna Akhmatova. And the reason why I want to tell you, speak this poem, recite this poem to you tonight is because, uh, actually I don't quote it in that particular one, th this particular one in the book, because it changed my life. The poem is called The Muse, Musa. It's by Anna Akhmatova. And Akhmatova used to go to a Leningrad park where there were statues of Greek and Roman mythological figures, goddesses and gods. The Russians love their Greeks and Romans, absolutely. They still do, they really hark back to that time. Euterpe is the, one of the muses. She holds two little flutes in her hand. And when she visits you, she imparts creativity to you. So this is Musa, the muse by Anna Khmatova. It's only eight lines long. I'll read it in Russian because I know, for instance, Professor Stockwood speaks Russian, and you, there may be others, but you can just listen to it, and then I'll, I'll tell it, I'll read it to you in English. Когда я ночью жду ее прихода, жизнь кажется висит на волоске. Что почести, что юность, что свобода пред милой гости с дудочкой руки. И вот вошла, откинув покрывало. Внимательно взглянула на меня. Ей говорю, ты Данте диктовала страницы ада. Отвечает я. So I have to read the English, I'm sorry. Translate it for you. When at night I wait for her arrival, life, it seems, is hanging by a thread. What are honors? What's youth? What's freedom? Before this lovely guest with flute in hand. So she entered, and tossing aside her mantle, she looked at me with a piercing glaze. I ask her, was it you who dictated to Dante the pages of hell? And she answers, it was. And this poem, which I was walking around Regent's Park about an hour and a half ago, reciting to myself, as I do almost every day, really meant a great, means a great deal to me. Because, particularly because of the line, what are honors, what is youth, what is freedom before this guest, this lovely guest with the flute in hand. And despite the time spent in the Soviet Union, the spy scandal, a lot of things that happened in the United States, which I talk about but I can't talk about here for lack of time, like my participating in the 1960 Democratic National Convention, the one that nominated John F. Kennedy, uh, and being involved to a certain extent in politics and political things in Australia. I write quite a bit about Australia. It all means little in front of the guest. And I thought, yes, politics and 
economics and all of things are extremely important, vital. War, how could we think that these things don't decide our fate? But in the end, the important thing for who you are is those encounters with the works of art that you have, the people that you meet, the people you love, you come to love, and this becomes a light motif, the light motif of, of your life. Not necessarily all the things that happen in the Soviet Union and so on. Now in speaking about the Japanese narrative, there's a, a DVD, about three minutes of a DVD I want to show you. On March 11th, 2011, I was in a very unusual place. It's the day of the great uh, East Japan, Eastern Japan earthquake. Uh, I was in the Naikakufu, the cabinet office, which is the hub of Japanese <coughs> policy making. I had gone for a three o'clock meeting to give a talk to the senior bureaucrats there, bureaucrats there about what's called in Japanese bunka gaiko, cultural diplomacy. And 14 minutes before, the ground started to shake. I had, was just in front of it, and I was looking towards Kasumi Yaseki and saw the buildings, 40 and 50 story buildings, not swaying like this, but looking like something out of a watercolor by George Gross like this and that, which is interesting because Gross's watercolors were about the collapse of capitalism and I thought, well, this is it. This is the collapse of capitalism. This is the end of Japan. I thought it was a chokogeki. I thought this was hitting Tokyo directly, but it wasn't, obviously. It was up in, in Tohoku. Uh, seven months later to the day, I took a, an NHK director, cameraman, and sound man and made four programs for NHK about the earthquake at, as it, and the tsunami as it affected Iwate with a, with a slant on the works of the writer whom I've spent 50 years studying and translating, Miyazawa Kenji, who's from Hanamaki, which is a small town in Iwate. And the little clip I'm going to show you, it's in Japanese, but I'll explain to you as, as it's shown. Uh, is from Rikuzen Takata, which is on the coast, which was a town uh, that was totally hit by the tsunami. You may know it as a town with the 60,000 pine tree forest, all of which but one was decimated, uh, torn down, torn away by the tsunami. And this is the, the 11th of October. 2011年、陸前高田。OK。詰まっていたんだなっていうところが新鮮でした。銀河鉄道の夜一緒に読み解いていただく先生ご紹介しましょう。はい。作家で東京工業大学世界文明センター長のロジャー・パルバーさんです。
子供とか年寄りが心細くてね逃げられない。あの現場をご覧になったらもうバルバーさんの涙は。そうですね。Unfortunately, neither the, the droppings of the atom, two atom bombs, which was the greatest geopolitical catastrophe of the 20th century. Sorry, Mr. Putin. And this and the subsequent meltdown of three of the reactors at the Daiichi Fukushima Genpatsu,、uh, those two things should have changed Japan. They didn't. Japan was very lucky. I'm going to say something that may sound ironical. This isn't a Jewish joke, I promise you. Japan was lucky to have lost the war. So was Germany. Britain also lost World War II, but they've been celebrating victory ever since. And it's very, America lost Viet, the Vietnam War, but they didn't acknowledge it. And they're paying the price ever since. It's a very good thing to lose a war. The Japanese, I mean, despite all the deaths. And, I heard horrible things, don't misunderstand me. But、um, this was a chance to rewrite the narrative of Japan. I talk a lot about the Tohoku tsunami in the book, and I can't go into it now, it takes too long. But it didn't happen because the government that took over promised reform, but the reform, and it's the same government that's been in power since, is all t i p And no iceberg. It's just on the surface. Or what we say in Texas all hat and no cattle. It's just bluster. And thing, the narrative has gone on the same way it has in the 80s. When the bubble burst in the 90s, that was also a chance to change Japan. It didn't. So I'm hoping, actually, I'm the last optimist in the room, and I'm hoping that Japan. I feel confident that Japan will change. I was there in the 1960s. I saw not only radical students, tens of thousands of them, but salary men and wor working women, women who are mothers, housewives, also demonstrating outside. I remember a radical Japan. I remember Japan that had a radical culture, film culture. And I brought some other things to read for you, but there's not enough time because we're going to go to QA. But just before we do go into QA, I have one other DVD. This one takes five minutes, but I absolutely want to show this to you.、Uh, after the tsunami and the earthquake, NHK commissioned two very talented people, Iwai Shinji and Kon no Yoko, to, to write the lyrics and the music for a recovery song. And that song turned out to be very beautiful, and it's been sung by millions of people, not only in Japan. And played over and over again all around the world. It's called Hana Wasaku, Flowers Will Bloom. And I have a,、um, a DVD of the song, which is full of hope for the future. And I'd like to end the talk on a note of hope rather than on a black note. And、uh, like to think that this is the true spirit of Japan as we go into the third decade of the 21st century very soon. And This particular one is sung by many celebrities, all of whom are from Tohoku. And when it's finished, we'll have question, question and answer. Okay, and I'll sit. Next to Pete. Can you see? Well, that is what I'd like to do. Future. Thank you very much.